and Femi OK. On today's episode of The Stream, we look at the increasing number of attacks on elderly Asian Americans, the connection with the coronavirus pandemic, and why so many of these stories are either ignored or underreported. We start with an passionate appeal for help that went viral. Last Thursday, an 84 year old Thai American was murdered in San Francisco. He died this week. On Wednesday, a 64 year old Vietnamese grandmother was assaulted in San Jose. And on the same day, a Filipino American was slashed across the face on a subway in Manhattan. The mainstream media does not spotlight our stories enough. We matter, and racism is killing us. We are joined by Amanda Wynn. Also, we're joined by Helen and also Cynthia. All of our guests will be able to tell us more about this situation with the Asian American community and communities across the United States. Amanda, nice to have you. Tell everybody who you are, what you do. Thank you so much for having me. And again, it's so wonderful to be here with incredible panelists and incredible host. My name is Amanda Wynn. I'm a civil rights activist. I'm the CEO and founder of RISE. And I'm here to talk about the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes. Good to have you. Hello there, Helen. Nice to have you on the stream. Tell everybody who you are, what you do. Hi, Femi. I'm um, just honored to be here. And thank you, Al Jazeera, for taking on this topic. I'm Helen Zia, long-time social justice and fighting hate crimes and in particular anti-Asian violence since the first landmark uh, case came up in the 1980s uh, with the killing of Vincent Shin. And thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us and hello there Cynthia. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Welcome to the stream. Thank you Femi. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share more about um, what we're doing at Chinese for Affirmative Action. Uh, my name is Cynthia Che, and I'm the co-executive director um, with CAA and also one of the co-founders of Stop API Hate, uh, which is a leading aggregator documenting anti-Asian racism and xenophobia since the start of the pandemic. And this conversation is streaming on YouTube. YouTubers, you can join our conversation really easy. Just jump into the comments section and you can talk to our guests. I try and get your opinions, your thoughts to our guests as soon as possible. Amanda, I'm just looking here on your YouTube, uh, on your Twitter post. You also posted it on Instagram. 18,000 people liked it. 15,000 people shared it. You touched a nerve. What made you take to social media? to speak out about these attacks that you were seeing? Well, social media is a platform that has allowed a lot of voices, not usually portrayed in mainstream media, to be heard. Uh, and the reality is that Asian American stories were not being covered, not our grief, not our excellence, not our contributions. And so that's why I took to social media. On top of that, I was mad, and I still am, that we and our stories need to fight to be seen. And I'm so, so, so grateful for the response that has come. Cynthia, I'm just thinking that any community that, and this is most of our communities, who has great respect for our elderly will be shocked when they see some of these stories. I have to share with our audience uh, the story of Vicha Ratanapati. Uh, Elderly gentleman here, have a look at his picture, and I'm just going to scoot up so you can see what happened to him, which is truly shocking. Unprovoked attack, pushed, he's 84 years old. What kind of, oh, goodness me, what kind of attacks are you seeing? What are the stats that you have, Cynthia? Yes, so um, one thing that I want to just share right out that is that since we started tracking um, anti-Asian racism and xenophobia in March, we've seen uh, over 2,800 incidents of uh, racism and discrimination directed at Asian Americans. And what we're seeing is that, at least from our data, that a majority of these incidents are what we would consider verbal attacks and harassment 
while people are living their daily lives under the pandemic. So as essential workers, as frontline workers, uh, delivery drivers, uh, school nurses, et cetera, are being subjected, um, are being dehumanized. And we are also seeing um, a category of uh, discrimination in the workplace, um, online bullying, uh, certainly in social media as an accelerator of hate. Um, and then we do have some instances of what we would consider hate crimes. So uh, being here in the Bay Area, um, where we have had um, visibility on these recent attacks, it has been a very painful time for our community. And it's one of the reasons why we held actions over this past weekend to really voice our concerns, to condemn these attacks and to demand action. Helen, I have to bring you in here because a lot of people on YouTube are having trouble believing what they're seeing. They're not sure that what they're seeing is real. And a lot of these attacks are in the Oakland area where you live. When you saw them, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna play some more video. This is real video people who are having trouble on YouTube believing this. As I speak through it, Helen, can you tell me what you think is happening at this particular time? This video that you see here, this is from January of this year. This is shocking. Right. Helen, what right. is going on here? I find it unbelievable that people don't believe it. I mean, these are actual security video cameras um, yeah. and woman, because we have social media. Being mugged. Yeah, just like being mugged. Oh, three or four people right. around her. Right. And so these are being caught on um, security cameras. And so we do actually have, you know, proof that these are happening. But for Asian Americans, it, this is not only just happening. This was before the pandemic was first reported here in the United States. There have been elderly people and videos of them being pushed, shoved. I mean, these are like tackles, right? People are getting full body slams and, and they have died, as Amanda said, people have been killed. And, uh, and I'm afraid that these current videos you're showing are reflective of almost turning this into a sport. I do want to say that for Asian Americans, there's no disbelief. We are living through this and this um, present attention because of the these uh, rise of the number of videos that are being shown um, is something that's not new to us. And there is a strong feeling that one of the attention now is because uh, the videos are capturing uh, black people attacking Asian Americans. And I know that with mm. um, with the tracking that has been done by Stop AAPI Hate that Cynthia is talking about, yeah. that, that many of the other videos that we have seen for more than a year now, for m almost 14 months, um, have been uh, uh, perpetrated by people from many different races and backgrounds. And unfortunately, um, there's a feeling that these are being highlighted because they black people attack an American. The things that I think all of us on this panel recognize is the attacks on Asian Americans is part of white supremacy. It's part of trying to divide um, people of color against each other. And in particular now, um, Asian and black people against each other. But really the racism and anti-Asian violence that we are experiencing is rooted in white supremacy. And mm -hmm. so the efforts by all of color, all of conscience to fight um, systemic racism, systemic racism against black people is really part of what we're experiencing as Asian Americans. So we also have our, you know, our efforts are to stand sure. with the fight against um, systemic oppression. But what we're seeing now is part of the white supremacy to keep us divided. And, and and that is part of the problem. Helen, uh, I, this has not gone unnoticed, obviously, in, in, uh, amongst the Asian American communities, not community. Let me show you something here. And it was this video here that prompted two actors to say, hey, that person who ever did that, we need to help. 
This is Daniel Day Kim and Daniel Wu. They were offering a $25,000 reward to find the suspect who assaulted that elderly man in California. This is why Daniel Day Kim felt it was so important. Have a listen to him. For us, this is a daily, almost daily occurrence that we see news like this. And, and so it was this, this reward that we were offering for this single incident was really just the straw that broke the camel's back. And both Daniel and I thought that we have to do something more than just speak about this. We have to do something more than just retweet or, you know, try and use our platforms to say something. We needed to put, quite frankly, our money where our mouth is to raise awareness for it in the way that, that we're able to talk about it right now. Amanda, I'm just wondering about the impact if you are from a community that is being targeted in this way during a pandemic, what is happening? What are you hearing from your friends, families, friends of friends in terms of how are they trying to protect themselves? Yeah, I, I'll answer that in a second, but I do want to address one of the comments mm. that was made earlier, which is that some people sure. still don't believe that this is happening. What, what else? What else do you need? This is literally caught on camera. So what do you think is going on? Like people are pretending this, is it like staged? Our grief has to be literally documented. And even when it's on video camera, you still don't believe this is happening. You know, I want to draw attention to this two-year-old and six-year-old that were stabbed in Texas and the man who stabbed them literally on the record said that he stabbed them because they were Asian and he thought that they were spreading COVID. So if you don't actually believe what you're seeing and you don't actually believe from the perpetrator's mouth that we are being attacked because of the rhetoric that has been scapegoated, used to other us, then what is gonna make you actually see us as human? Like that enrages me. And I want everyone <laughs> to give me an answer, right? What, what else, what else will make you believe that we are being attacked? Um, beyond that gaslighting, uh, and sorry, I don't mean, you know, th thank you for bringing that issue up. Um, to answer your question, you know, it's a fog of fear. It's a fog of terror for the Asian American community, at least for the, m my friends who walk out the door, who have family members and are thinking, oh, well, you know, how can we look a certain way so we don't get stabbed in the grocery store or get pushed down on the street and killed or get slashed on the subway? All of these are real things that have happened, right? And so when you have this fear this, from random people who are coming at you, who might be a threat to you, who might take your life, it's time to stand up and say something. And this is, I, I know that there has been a rise in, in America, but I know this is an international audience. And I wanna say in solidarity with all of the Asian community that's out there, I know that this is not only an American issue. And so I recognize that pain. And I wanna also address what has been said earlier, that this is an intersectional issue and that we are stronger together, that I denounce anti-Black sentiment and that we need to work together, we cannot be anti-Black in the work that we do. Cynthia, I would love you to listen to Christina Wong, who is adding to our conversation. We spoke to her a little bit earlier, and we wanted to see if we could pinpoint what is happening to the Asian American community that they are being targeted in this violent way during the COVID pandemic. And Christina just went ahead and said this. So what I'd love to see is for this current administration and for lots of culture makers to stand up and take a stance against Trump's use of the term China virus. It's a racist term. It's a misleading term. It's what has, I think, fueled a lot of the anti-Asian hate. It's furthered this thinking that all Chinese people are a monolith, whether they were born here, born somewhere else, had the virus, didn't have the virus. And once we get beyond that basic acknowledgement that the way this virus has been talked about by the people who were previously in charge as racist, I think beyond that, we think about talking about the Asian American heroes in America who are working on the front lines, who are also susceptible to this virus, who have also died from this virus, and who are putting their lives at risk so that people do not die from this virus. Cynthia, go ahead, well, just come off the back of that thought there. 
Well, she was spot on. Um, one of the reasons why we started Stop API Hate is because we needed to document this. We wanted people to take uh, this issue very seriously. And I think it's really important for everyone to know that uh, these incidents, these firsthand accounts, witness accounts of hate and discrimination doesn't come out of a vacuum. We had had the former president uh, con uh, insist on calling the coronavirus the China virus. Um, and many, many years of anti-immigrant policies, we know that history has shown us, and we don't have to look back that far, that in times of crisis, whether it's public economic crisis or with US foreign policy, that our communities, the Asian community, um, is scapegoated and blamed. And that's exactly what happened. Um, we believe that this needs to be addressed from an interpersonal level, but also from a policy level. We really need to ensure that during this time of racial reckoning, of recognizing the role that structural racism plays, including pitting our communities together, uh, is something that we're going to reject. And this is an important fight for all of us. Um, and we are connecting the, the dots and we are working towards addressing this issue as an entire community. I am just looking at some of the things that President Biden has done recently. He signed an executive action where he condemned the xenophobic language that's been used related to that pandemic. Uh, Helen, how does this help? Well, it's a marked contrast between the prior president who used every opportunity to attack China, to attack um, on his, you know, hate mongers, which saw that he so effectively did um, against the Capitol. But that's what he did for, you know, most of his administration, calling people to attack the Chinese enemy. And even when Russia was clearly implicated on incidents um, uh, of national security, he would still say, but it could be China. And just as Cynthia and Amanda have been saying, it's this um, a geopolitization that he's been goading, blaming, and blaming um, people who look like the enemy, which is you know the largest population of, of people in the world, and um, as Amanda said, it's not just an American phenomenon. These attacks have been going on every continent except for Antarctica. And so the um, attacks on communities that are Chinatowns, little Saigons, little Tokyos, um, that pain has been experienced ever since this pandemic uh, began. And I'd like to go back to your question about impact on our communities beyond the, the, the actual assaulted, whether verbally or physically, um, people from the very beginning started going underground. And what I mean by that is these very seniors who dare to go out and take a walk um, have been hiding out. They're afraid to go to their doctors. They're afraid to go get food. And so what we're also seeing in terms of the pandemic is that, that there is so little information about people, Asian American, Asian people, and how they are affected by the coronavirus. So uh, repeatedly we see reports coming out saying, how, you know, Latinx um, have mortality uh, rates or morbidity rates from the, from the virus, but nothing about Asians because many are not even getting tested. When they're sick, they're not going to the, uh, to the doctor they're not getting medications. And so the actual harm is, is extensive and not being counted. Basically, we're being blamed, we're being attacked, and we are being ignored. And while we welcome the Biden administration coming out and making a statement, it's got way more than that. And this thing about being vulnerable communities against each other, what has to is is assistance needs to come and lift up these communities that are being so devastated by this pandemic. Yeah. And for Asian Americans, that mm -hmm. devastation includes these racist attacks. Sure. Uh, one of 
one of the aspects that often happens where, where communities are attacked and it's because of race racism uh, often the onus is on well what are you going to do about it but it actually isn't your problem it's not your racism it's racism coming to you so what are they going to do about the issue not what are you going to do about the issue but i want to bring in here christina on who's talking about movement building have a listen to what she has to say our research has shown how fears of xenophobia, the racialization of AAPIs, and the rise of hate crimes are compounding to create more fear than the virus itself. For many of our respondents, it's become clear that being Asian or identified as Asian is enough to be harassed and blamed for COVID-19. Racialization, especially in the U.S., demonstrates that if someone perceives or racializes you in a certain way, it doesn't matter how that individual might self-identify. At the same time, AAPI communities are finding and building resistance to hate crimes through volunteering, advocacy, and consciousness raising. We find that social movements like Black Lives Matter open up dialogue for exploring the meaning of Asian American identity and experiences of racism in the context of the pandemic and beyond. I'm just looking at this website here, Stop AAPI Hate. Cynthia, I know you felt it was really important in this conversation to talk about the work that is being done right now to try and counter um, this racism that is happening to Asian Americans right now. Cynthia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to just share that we have been in communication with our respondents. So people who came onto our site and told us traumatic stories that they or their family members experienced. And one of the main reasons why they came onto our reporting center is to be a part of the collective voice to say, yes, this happened to me, this happened to my mother, my grandmother, uh, my children. And so it's really important for us to collectively lift up these stories. And I also want to share that locally, how we've been responding is by ensuring that we work with our elected officials to uh, make sure that we address the needs of survivors and their families. We're also working very closely to expand intervention and prevention-based programs that meet the specific needs of the API community. And then finally, we do believe that uh, as many of us had been working on uh, for many years, decades, to build cross-racial, cross-solidarity and community building work, the communities that are directly impacted, low income communities, uh, people who are living in public housing, uh, our elderly who have been isolated for a very long time, uh, not just under the pandemic, but in terms of overall issues, when you look at uh, disparities, economic housing, those who are facing food insecurity, these have been issues that we have been addressing for a very long time. And the pandemic has really just exacerbated and really exposed how vulnerable our communities are. Mm. And I do want to emphasize that the crime and violence are, are not new to our community. This time of racial reckoning has been an opportunity for Asian Americans to say that we have solutions we need to be resourced and community-based organizations who are on the ground really have the best understanding of what our community needs. And we're looking forward to working with our elected officials. Um, and we're also part of a national movement of API leading organizations who are fighting for racial equity and economic justice. Cynthia, thank you so much for being on the stream today and Helen and Amanda. 25 minutes is not long enough. We only just got started, but I want people to be able to follow your work. So have a look here on my laptop. Stop AAPI hate. They also have a website. Helen Zia, Helen Zia Real, author, journalist, activist. I highly recommend you visit her on Twitter. And then of course, Amanda, Amanda's not just on Twitter, she's also on Instagram. Do follow her. You will be really taken along with what she feels is important, what we need to know, not just in America, but around the world. Guests, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. YouTubers, interesting conversation and pushback. Do follow those Twitter handles there. 
and give you some more perspective. Thanks for watching. I'm Femi OK, signing off. See you next time.